Now again, I've tried to put things in some sort of logical order from the standpoint of you know, how things are applied. Uh, we talked before about the uh, last week, the first one being uh, how do taxpayers, in fact, decide what they are, uh, you know, in terms of are they a taxpayer, uh, is an entity a disregarded entity, or treated as a corporation. That's sort of the first, a first step. And then we went through characterization as being a second step. And then thirdly, uh, we went through a bit about uh, transfer pricing, because now that we've identified who are taxpayers, we have to look to what are the transactions between them and make sure that pricing, uh, in fact, uh, is appropriately reflected using good transfer pricing concepts. And uh, at this point, and that's the point where we are now. So what's the next step? Now, the next step uh, in here I put down as direct taxation of foreign taxpayers. Any idea why I chose that next instead of, for example, subpart F? Why would I choose one first before the other? Well, the reason uh, is that within the code itself, there are, although not directly uh, nice things saying, you apply this first, then that, there are things that you find in the code and the regulations where it will say, for example, in the subpart F area, well, gee, we don't treat effectively connected income that is already being taxed by the U.S. as subpart F income. So just by its very nature, you have to look to the one first and then to the second one. We're looking at, of course, uh, Apple up here. And we're now thinking about direct taxation of foreign taxpayers. We know that AOI, we said, was the CFC. Under what circumstances could the US look at AOI and say, gee, uh, we want to tax you directly? We know that subpart F and guilty are, in a sense, indirect U.S. taxation because guilty and subpart F are taxation of Apple on certain income which is earned at the AOI level. Direct taxation, though, means that AOI is the taxpayer. AOI would have to file a tax return in the United States, calculate its effectively connected income, and pay tax thereon. Now, this was something that you would have covered in the T515 class. Any thoughts on uh, what might make uh, AOI taxable directly by the US? What does AOI have to have in order to be subject to direct taxation? OK, well, let's, let's change your language slightly. You need. Uh, to be conducting a trader business in the United States. That's the first threshold question. Is AOI as a CFC in the conduct of its business, does it conduct a trader business in the United States? Well, uh, does AOI have its own employees in the United States? Any ideas? Probably not. Probably not. You're right. It doesn't. Does it have directors in the United States? Are those directors maybe doing things on some sort of a consistent basis that might be involved in the conduct of business? What if those directors are regularly signing agreements in the name of AOI for example, with contract manufacturers, with suppliers, those, that sort of thing. Well, maybe that maybe that's could rise to that level. We know that AOI is involved 
as a manufacturer in the sourcing of its own products. Remember that AOI, because of the cost sharing agreement, AOI owns the IP which allows it to manufacture, albeit through contract manufacturers, but it has the right to manufacture the products and sell them through its geographic territory, which is generally everywhere in the world outside of, uh, I guess, the Americas or however uh, Apple defines it. We know uh, what, what constitutes production activities. Josh, what kind of activities are production activities? Manufacturing. Ma okay, manufacturing, that's fine. Okay, so the physical part of it we know is the contract manufacturer. But are there some other functions which are importantly a part of the manufacturing process? Buying materials or employing people? Yeah, the, well, the first one is, uh, is excellent. Uh, deciding on uh, where components are going to be manufactured. Uh, negotiating agreements with those suppliers. Negotiating the agreements with the contract manufacturers. How many items are we going to produce? What level of quality control do we, do we have to have in order to satisfy our, uh, you know, our objectives for products to get into the hands of consumers and then hopefully not fail during an outbound class when you're in the middle of note taking? <laughs> You ever had a computer fail on you? Not yet. Okay, that's encouraging. So the point is that a lot of this work is a real part of manufacturing. Where is that being conducted? Is that in Ireland? Or is that all in Cupertino, which is the home base in California for Apple? We don't know, let's say, all of the details, but I think it's probably safe to assume that 90 or 95 percent of that effort is being done in California. Is the work that is performed by a related company that benefits another group company, in this case uh, work that, let's say, Apple Inc. does that benefits uh, AOI, the CFC, is that work which should be thought of as being uh, the CFC itself? Or is the fact that it's done by a related party and they get a, you know, a commission for it, uh, you know, a service fee, uh, should that be enough so that it's not actually the activity of the CFC? There's, there's no bright line tests in this area. I think it's fair to say that uh, Apple is probably not worried about this concern uh, because they've been carrying on this way for many years and we have not seen in their financial statements any disclosure that the IRS is questioning them on this. Would the amount be large if the IRS were to question them on this? What would the tax consequence be if AOI itself was found to be engaged in a U.S. trader business and to have a significant amount of effectively connected income because of these manufacturing activities in the United States on its behalf? Do you think it's a small tax? Do you think it's a large tax? What tax is there on effectively connected income? Okay, who took T515? It's U.S. rates, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, normal U.S. rates. So pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it would have been 35%. Now it's 21%. Does anybody remember uh, what, at least according to the syllabus, was going to be a, an entire class session of T515? Uh, the branch profits tax in Section 884. Does anybody remember that expression? You're smiling, Josh. Does that mean you remember it, or does that mean that no <laughs> chance at all? Uh, you know, I figured it out right before the final. And I forgot it. 
uh, well, it's a 30% rate on, let's say, the equivalent of earnings and profits. And earnings and profits, remember, is after tax. So on a pre-tax cuts and jobs act basis, remember you have 100 of taxable income, 35% tax, leaves 65 after tax. 65 times 30, you know, give or take a bit, is uh, close to 20. So 20 and 35 would be somewhere around 55. So the actual effective tax rate on AOI there, the CFC, would be like something close to 55% if the IRS were to attempt to clobber Apple and say, hey, this is all nonsense what you're doing. You're really having the CFC earn income in the United States, which should be effectively connected income. So that's a, that's a rather uh, large amount. That's much higher than if they had just uh, treated all this income as U.S. income of the, uh, of the parent company in the first place. So again, is Apple worried about this? I don't think so. But when we look at these kinds of profit-shifting structures and we see very significant operations being conducted in the United States, this is a, a, at least something that ought to be thought about. Now, is this the only way to have a U.S. trader business where uh, AOI is, uh, is found to be engaged directly in a U.S. trader business? Does anybody remember Section 875. It's really short and sweet. Somebody look at the first paragraph of that. What does that say? Yeah, if the partnership is engaged in a trader business, then any non-U.S. partner will be treated as also engaged in a U.S. trader business. Now, is there any partnership up here that you see? Okay, you have, uh, again, I think in the... Uh, in T515, and we covered some of it here, of course, also, you studied something about the check the box rules. You've also, some of you are also at this very moment taking the partnership course. Might you say that Apple and AOI are conducting a joint business? If you looked at Apple as, uh, as a consumer, which of course some of you are, if you, uh, you know, were traveling overseas and had trouble with you, your uh, computer, would you feel any hesitation at going into an Apple store in another country and attempting to get your computer fixed? Would you feel any hesitation at buying a, an Apple product overseas and bringing it here back home and using it you know, for the rest of its useful life here in the United States. From your perspective as a consumer, do you see anything other than, in a sense, one worldwide organization that is providing certain products and services? Do you see any dividing line between the geographic coverage of Apple Inc. and the geographic coverage of AOI? I was commenting before about uh, the production activities which presumably are going on in Cupertino which benefit uh, AOI. Again, I don't know whether you've gotten into this in your partnership course, but uh, the partnership rules essentially say pretty clearly that if two organizations have joint production, that causes a partnership. Even if both parties take the production in kind and sell it on their own. There's a partnership. There's another way to, in a sense, look at some of the things you're learning, whether in this course or the partnership course or T515, and applying that to what they're doing. Now, we could go beyond production and we could say, well, 
uh, gee, uh, is Apple Inc. involved at all in the solicitation, negotiation, or other significant services relating to the sales of AOI? What's one class of, what's a one important class of customer for AOI? I don't know, uh, you know, for every country, of course, but there's a few countries where you can say, gee, I know that there's this major telecom company that probably buys five million iPhones a year from uh, AOI. Do you think that nobody at the Apple level is involved in that? that influences what ends up happening in terms of negotiations about the terms of sale, the pricing, and so on. Uh, I think it's fair to say that probably at the Apple level there's also some influence with regard to, or some participation in as opposed to necessarily influence. Uh, I think influence would be very clear, but participation in solicitation, negotiation, and other things that go on. Now, if that, in fact, is true, that's, again, more uh, support, so to speak, that, well, maybe there's a partnership for U.S. tax purposes between these two companies. Now, if there is, then one result is that Section 875, which says that if the partnership is conducting a U.S. trader business, so is the partner. Calculate effectively connected income. And because, uh, especially if it is found that the production is within the United States, then you know there's going to be quite a bit of income which is U.S. source, and therefore under the effectively connected income rules will be effectively connected with this rather large tax uh, resulting. You need to be, again, looking at what are people doing? Who is doing what? Where are they doing it? And then attempt to fit uh, the various mechanisms we have on this. Is there a partnership or not? Well, clearly Apple doesn't think so. But uh, a reasonable case, I think, at least based on our assumed facts, which may or may not be true, but to some extent uh, are there in, uh, in public documents. Okay, any, uh, anything else on this area before we go on to the next subject in this, uh, this listing, which is uh, subpart F? Let's go back to our facts. What is AOI doing? AOI through its disregarded entity subsidiaries, number one, of course, owns all this in intellectual property which allows it to manufacture or have manufactured through, uh, through uh, unrelated contract manufacturers uh, certain products and then to sell those products around the world. And I think it's uh, I think uh, most of you will hopefully remember from some of the discussion of the various companies that this certainly sidesteps subpart F because we're looking at foreign-based company sales income. And the two criteria to have foreign-based company sales income are, Kenny, is a related party involved? And is the point of origination and point of destination outside the country of incorporation? The point is that uh, on the surface, of course, AOI does not have to worry about subpart F. And again, remember, subpart F, we are looking at specific categories of activities, foreign-based company sales income, foreign-based company services income, and foreign personal holding company income. Let's stay with foreign-based company sales income for a moment. Uh, I, don't rem I, I know that it's in the slides, but I don't remember whether we covered it in class uh, when uh, we were doing subpart F, and that is something called the branch rule. Does anybody remember anything about the branch rule? You find you find a very 
short and pithy statement about it in 954D as in David 2. And then you find these absolutely terrible, they're probably some of the worst, the worst written uh, regulations you will ever find in 1.954-3B as in boy. I would not uh, uh, force on my worst enemy uh, you know, a requirement to read those regulations. They're absolutely terrible. But the question is, well, let me step back a moment. The branch rule looks at something like this where there is, in this case, an Irish company that is seen, because of the disregarded entity status of the subsidiaries, as having branches in a bunch of places. And the concern of the branch rule is that if you are trying to avoid foreign tax, not US tax so much, but if you are trying to avoid foreign tax through the use of branches, because you know, whereas the United States, of course, for many years up until recently had this, I'm sorry, uh, let me uh, step back. Uh, a number of uh, foreign countries have rules that allow a foreign branch to be free of tax in the country of incorporation. So, uh, for example, maybe uh, a German company uh, has a uh, a branch in Switzerland and uh, the uh, German company manufactures the product and then has the branch in Switzerland sell it. And Germany might not tax the income of the branch. Now, the branch rule looks at this and says, well, if there is a big reduction in tax because of this, big reduction in foreign tax because of this, then we will treat the branch as if it were a separate corporation, and we will then retest for foreign-based company sales income. If we have this kind of situation, let's uh, draw it out. If we have, let's say, US up here, and then there's a, uh, a German company with a, a branch in Switzerland, and uh, because of this structure, we end up with a tax rate uh, on the relevant income uh, that goes through the branch of its, uh, the, the formula is either 90% of or five percentage points less than uh, the, in this case, the German rate. So let's say the German rate was 30%. Well, 90% of 30 is 27, but five percentage points less than 30 is 25. So if the income that goes through the branch and that is realized by the branch and is not taxable in Germany, if that income is less than 25%, uh, if, if that income is taxed less than 25%, then the branch rule kicks in and says we will treat the branch like it is a separate CFC. Now we retest and maybe the uh, sale is going from, uh, from Germany to, let's say, France. From the standpoint of the now make-believe Swiss CFC, you have a related party involved because it was manufactured by Germany. You have point of destination, point of origination, both outside of Switzerland. And now you have for that sales income, foreign based company sales income, and therefore subpart F. Well, how might that be relevant for AOI's situation? Let's put the Apple uh, you know, chart back on here. AOI has, let's say, a branch in France. Is AOI going to be, uh, with regard to sales into France, 
worried about this branch rule or not? Probably not, because most sales that the French subsidiary deals with are going to be sales into France. So probably not there. The, the test uh, of point of origination, point of destination would not be met. And as a result, it's just not foreign-based company sales income. But what about Singapore, which is this very small island and which maybe is making sales into Malaysia, Indonesia, other places outside? Uh, the point is that with Singapore, maybe it's more likely that there would be uh, potential applicability because point of origination, point of destination is outside the country of incorporation of this make-believe pseudo CFC for purposes of this branch rule. I said that the tax rate that you have to be concerned about was 90% of or five percentage points less than the rate where? The rate in Ireland. The rule tells us to look to Ireland. What's the Irish tax rate on trading income? Anybody remember from your, those of you who are taking T550 and you heard a talk by uh, one of the uh, attorney from Ireland or from an Irish firm? Yeah, 12 and a half percent, 12 and a half percent. Your memory serves you well. So what's five percentage points less than 12 and a half percent? Did I hear a seven and a half somewhere? Yeah, 7.5. Okay, uh, what's the tax rate in most of these other places that's going to be applied to the sales income through to the extent that uh, there's taxability in those locations? Well, probably more than 7.5%. 7.5% is a pretty low figure. The way things work out, I think as a practical matter, Apple is not bothered by these. Now, if AOI were found, you know, if we had this partnership situation and AOI were found to have, for example, through the partnership, a manufacturing location within the United States, then there's another part of the branch rule which I will not go into, which is called the manufacturing branch rule. And it's, uh, it's more convoluted than what we've just been talking about. And there uh, it, it might potentially affect Apple. But before you get there, there has to be a manufacturing location, in essence, of AOI in the United States, which may be true in, you know, in a sense economically, but uh, because of their structure, it's not theirs. It's, uh, it's provided by Apple through the service agreement, and of course Apple would claim it uh, does not, that its CFC does not have a manufacturing facility in the United States. I think I've kind of lost the thread of what we're talking about. Well, what we're, okay, good, uh, thank you. Uh, what we're talking about in the big picture is we're trying to apply the subpart F rules to Apple and AOI. Yeah. The big thing is that Apple has sidestepped for AOI the subpart F rules because AOI acquires its inventory that gets resold, it's Apple branded products, from unrelated contract manufacturers. It sells through the blob, it sells to unrelated parties, Apple resellers, uh, telecoms, customers through the, uh, the various Apple online stores to unrelated parties, sells to unrelated parties so that as a result, on the surface, there is no subpart, there is no foreign-based company sales income. Then we're saying, okay, there's also this branch rule found in 954 D2, which can, even in this kind of situation, 
make some of the income potentially foreign based company sales income. And we're saying that with respect to the sales branch rule that Apple probably is able to sidestep this because the test is based on Ireland's tax rate of 12 and a half, 90% of, or five percentage points less, which means that as long as there's an effective tax rate on the income earned in a uh, Singapore, for example, that as long as there's an effective tax rate of at least 7.5% on the income that's appropriately placed there, there's not going to be uh, any subpart F income. From AOI's perspective, this is an interesting point. Uh, from AOI's perspective, it has a rather large gross profit. How much of that gross profit, which reflects the intellectual property uh, that goes into this computer, how much of that gross profit is attributable to the uh, intellectual property versus the gross profit which is attributable to the economic sales functions that are carried out in Singapore. Right. The part attributable to intellectual property is like this. The part that's attributable to the sales activities is like this. <laughs> when you have a company, unlike Apple, that's selling you know, Apple's selling things, to, as you say, to unrelated parties, whether it's doing it in Ireland or Singapore or France. Um, but sort of like back to home base for me is like, but Facebook is different because it's not selling a, a computer or a thing or even if a non-intangible thing, right? So there you really are in a related party scheme when you have all of your little piano keys here at the bottom, <laughs> the big thing at the top, right? So is it different? Are you saying in a situation where you have, um, where the, the business that you're in is sales to the public in France or institutional sales in Singapore or whatever, that's, that's gonna, in a sense, get rid of the set part at a question. Well, like the... Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, no, what you're expressing is, uh, is excellent. And this is a good demonstration of why you have to start out with an understanding of the business that you're trying to analyze. We're looking with the Apple situation at a sale of a manufactured product. If we look at a Facebook or a Google where the business model is earning advertising revenues from, this, from advertisers who are able to place ads in front of the eyeballs of hundreds or thousands or millions of potential customers and to, of course, pinpoint the type of customers, the types of eyeballs that they want to place the ads in front of, that's, yes, a different business model. Apple is the manufacture and sale of a product. What would we say about a Google or, uh, or a Facebook? Uh, is that more in the nature of a service to the advertiser who is paying the advertising fee? Sure. Yeah, that makes sense to me also. Uh, no question. It's, it's not exactly the same thing as if, uh, you know, Josh over here is a plumber and you have a pipe that needs to be fixed. But there's, there's a certain similarity in the sense of it being a service. Okay, so we, uh, we can't look at the foreign-based company sales income uh, for, uh, for uh, a Google or Facebook but we can look at foreign-based company services income. What are the criteria for foreign-based company services income? Related party involved, and number two, is there the service being conducted outside the country of incorporation? Now, in the case of a Facebook or a Google, on the surface, there is not a related party involved. Now, you could say, and I, I you know, I doubt that the IRS has necessarily thought about this, but you could 
certainly look at this and say, well, gee, the Facebook uh, Ireland company could not provide its service except for the fact that Facebook US, in fact, is running this platform on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, we even talked about a different aspect, too, in 515, which is the idea that um, a Nike brand's um, sort of gravitas comes from its success or its advertising or its branding in, like, the US. And that makes it more appealing in maybe other countries. And so how do you sort of differentiate that? And in a sense, I thought about that with Facebook and Google. Like, you know, the attraction isn't just the aver you know, driving the advertisers, but it's, it's the attraction of it is something that, where, where is that really driven? Is that attached to the platform, where the platform or the intellectual property or development or whatever is going on? Because that's what's keeping you leading in your brand or leading um, in your market. So I thought about that too, like we haven't talked about that so much and I don't really want to talk about it right now, either, right now. but you know, I've just thought about like, um, you know, the, the, the sort of how the things catch on, like the popularity of something, that seems to be derived from the US in both Google and Facebook, even though once it gets launched, it maybe takes on its own life in India and the UK. And yeah. It takes on its own life. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, a, a story of somebody from Japan uh, going to the United States and saying, oh my gosh, they have Makodano Rudo here in, uh, uh, in uh, the United States also. You know, so uh, yes, things do take on a life of their own. But if Absolutely. you're developing it, if you're constantly developing it back home, I guess my point is, you know, that's where the real value in what you're producing as a company really comes from and low park, then you're continually staying as a leader in that industry because of something you're doing in that low park, not something necessarily you did in Ireland. Yeah, and this is where, in a sense, the cost sharing agreements come in. That legitimizes the adoption of these developments and enhancements as being, in fact, the property of the foreign participant in the cost-sharing agreement. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Now, in terms of your question of is there foreign-based company services income, on the surface, probably not. Is there concern that maybe, you know, from a Facebook standpoint, that maybe there is foreign-based services uh, income? Oh, well, maybe. Uh, and, but that's because of the support and the uh, fact that the U.S. is making it possible for uh, Facebook Ireland to, in fact, run its own business. In any case, the point is we have to look at each, uh, each company and its business and how it conducts that business, and then we apply these rules. Uh, just one, uh, one final thing on uh, subpart F before we go to the next thing, and that is that, of course, within that CFC for many years before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and I suppose still, because uh, I haven't heard anything about them bringing money back to the United States, uh, within AOI, they build up, give or take a bit, $250 billion of cash. You know, it's sort of a large amount. Well, as I think you know from looking at foreign-based company sales, uh, sorry, foreign personal holding company income, that any dividends, interest that's earned on those funds will be subpart F income and as a result, Apple will currently pay U.S. tax uh, because of the subpart F inclusion, income inclusion, on Apple's uh, Form 1120, its corporate tax return. So again, subpart F, we look at the certain defined categories of income. Can they avoid that subpart F uh, on the foreign personal holdings on that $285 million billion worth of interest by shifting it into the DREs or something? I mean, is there a way to avoid that? Uh, no. Oh. Uh, I mean, first of all, if they 
either left it in or shifted it into a disregarded entity, it's disregarded. Remember that, uh, you know, taking the cash out of one pocket and putting it in another? That doesn't work from the uh, U.S. standpoint. Okay, now let's move to guilty, which is our next item. And whereas in the subpart F area we have defined bright line categories of income, guilty, and remember I kept saying, you know, it's hit with a sledgehammer or a baseball bat, whatever uh, term you like to use, guilty starts off with the total income within the blob, within the AOI blob. What is its income? Now, there's a few carve-outs, for example, like I uh, mentioned before in, in the context of, well, why do we talk about effectively connected income before subpart F and guilty? There's a carve-out for effectively connected income. Why did I just talk about subpart F income first and then second guilty? There's a carve out for subpart F income that is already being taxed at the shareholder level. The point in terms of contrast, again, is that guilty starts with the total profits that are in the AOI CFC, subtracts off 10% of the fixed assets, the uh, QBI qualified business asset investment, and that's the amount which now gets brought up at the, uh, the Apple parent level as an inclusion in its, uh, as an income inclusion in its tax return. If we look at Apple going forward, considering the relatively small amount of fixed assets, and what might their fixed assets be? Uh, well, of course, there's going to be tables and chairs and computers and other things that, uh, that are used in their business that are depreciable property. Probably the biggest item, I would think, is where they have data centers, server farms, and other support things. And again, I'm bringing this up not because you know it's important to know exactly uh, you know what Apple has. It's rather that if you are applying these rules, you have to know a little bit about the company and its business. Does it have a lot of fixed assets or not? Well, it does not because it's using these contract manufacturers. The big items of equipment and facilities are going to be owned by third parties which are not part of this AOI blob. Now I think I did see somewhere where yes Apple has financed and perhaps owns some of the equipment used by contract manufacturers and if so then that would push it up a bit. But still in terms of relative size of the numbers it's very small compared with the total income that AOI is earning and as a result when we look at the guilty which then gets brought up to the Apple level it's going to be for all practical purposes uh, a high percentage of whatever profits uh, are there. Can you restate this because uh, I just want to make sure I understand this. When we have something like Apple or any other basically technology company that's going to have a small amount of tangible assets. They are going to be paying more because they have more that gets assessed as guilty than a multinational with more fixed assets? Correct. Okay. Yeah, a multinational with more fixed assets has higher Q by. 10% of that figure, which is the subtraction item from you know, this whatever income the, the company earns after carved outs for effectively connected income, subpart F income, whatever you know, that, uh, that is, uh, subtract off the 10%. And if that 10% of QBI is higher because uh, in that business they do have higher fixed assets, then they have more Q by, they have less 
uh, guilty. And what does that then mean, which is sort of the next item? They have more other earnings and profits that will qualify for the dividend received deduction under new section 245 cap A. So if we look at Apple's situation where the fixed assets are relatively small, the dividend received deduction for 245 uh, of 245 cap A is going to be so small it's almost uh, uh, you know, almost a, uh, you know, a uh, non-issue or not so important to them. They just won't have much. Now, is it still a good idea for Apple to operate through AOI in this approach? We're saying almost all of it is guilty. Uh, well, that sort of takes us to the next step, you know, on this uh, listing that I have. Uh, which is going to be the deduction under Section 250 for 50% of guilty. And that's what gets us to that 10.5% effective tax rate on guilty. Now, when there's foreign taxes and you calculate the foreign tax credit and the Section 78 gross up, things get a bit complicated and it might not be exactly an effective tax rate of 10.5%, but uh, ignoring foreign taxes for a moment, again, because Apple has been so successful at reducing the level of foreign taxes through this structure, uh, I think at least for our discussion, we can say that they're guilty, which is going to be the bulk of their earnings uh, within uh, AOI CFC, that will be taxed at 10.5%, and compared with 21% if they uh, earned it back in the United States. And even if it were FDII, remember foreign derived intangible income, there would be a higher than 10.5% rate. So probably Apple is going to want to continue this as opposed to making a change post uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I just assumed it away because it's very low, but uh, we uh, should at least speak a little bit more about the foreign tax credit because, in fact, uh, Apple certainly pays some foreign taxes and uh, a lot of multinationals do pay some foreign taxes and how that fits in we should not uh, ignore. When AOI uh, or any of its disregarded entities pay foreign taxes to Ireland, to France, to Singapore, you know, or any other place in the world where these disregarded entities are operating. Those are foreign taxes where the CFC is the taxpayer. You'll recall that when we talked about foreign tax credits, we made a big distinction between foreign taxes that are directly paid by a U.S. person, in this case Apple, and foreign taxes that are deemed to be paid by Apple, and we referred to those as indirect, uh, indirect foreign taxes. The only time when a U.S. person is able to claim a tax credit for indirect taxes is when they are realized and are brought up under some appropriate section uh, to Apple as the, uh, you know, the U.S. taxpayer. Because again, AOI, ignoring that discussion we had about possible effectively connected income, uh, AOI is not a U.S. taxpayer. Only Apple is a U.S. taxpayer. So in terms of the taxes that are paid by AOI or any subsidiary of AOI, any disregarded entity subsidiary of AOI, those taxes will only be recognized at the Apple level when there is something that causes them to be deemed paid. We didn't uh, talk too much about pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 
and I will not go into that here uh, because it's it's a morass that uh, uh, if you have to get into in a job, and I hope you do, I hope you get a job and you <laughs> get into this stuff and suffer with it. But uh, anyway, so we won't go into that here. But what we can say, of course, is that under the new system from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, both subpart F and guilty create current inclusions of income at the Apple level. Certainly, we know that the foreign personal holding company income that's earned on all that cash at the AOI level is going to be foreign personal holding company income and directly taxable within the Apple tax return under subpart F. And that'll be at a 21% rate because, of course, there's no similar thing like the guilty 50% deduction that applies for, uh, for the guilty inclusion. Now, Section 960A, Section 960A says that when there's subpart F income, then any taxes that relate to that income, any foreign taxes that relate to that income, will be deemed paid, and that's you know on a current basis, deemed paid by Apple, and Apple will get a credit for that. Now, the chances that Apple is paying any significant amount of foreign taxes on its, uh, on its uh, foreign personal holding company income is pretty low because they will consciously make investments that do not involve being subject to foreign taxes. Uh, might there be? Yeah, maybe there is. But uh, it's not something that we would expect to see a lot of. On the other hand, when we look at guilty, guilty is going to include income earned in Ireland in Singapore, in France, and in every other country where, in fact, they do have some amount of income that is locally taxable. It may not be a large amount because through their planning, they have attempted to avoid tax in any country on a large part of that gross profit that's attributable to that intangible value, that intellectual property, the value of that. But there will be some amount of foreign taxes. So on a current basis, in the same year that Apple has to recognize that guilty, Section 960D, as in David, provides that 80% of the foreign taxes, you may recall we kept talking about a 20% haircut, 80% of the foreign taxes are deemed paid by Apple so that there can be a foreign tax credit against effectively that 10.5% tax on, uh, on guilty. Now, I think uh, Josh is probably at this point the expert on calculating the foreign tax credit limitation. I don't uh, like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, before, before we get there, yeah, to, you're, tra you're, you're saying before we get there in order to prevent my getting to, uh, no, to, to Josh or... No, to clarify, uh, oh no, you, you go for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, to clarify for the guilty, right? So Apple and all of its foreign entities um, end up with a hundred of guilty. Well, when you say Apple and all of its entities, let's say AOI and all of its okay. entities have a hundred of guilty, and then that hundred is recognized by Apple okay. in its tax return. Okay. Then there's, to and the extent of foreign taxes, there's the Section 78 gross up. Did they already reduce the rate of the guilty to 10.5? The hundred of guilty is after foreign taxes at uh, the AOI level. Yeah, so let's let's say let's say for example it's that they've paid five of uh, let's say their income before tax 
uh, that is guilty within AOI is 105, and okay. there's five of tax of local of local Lo no, local, sorry, local, tax. local taxes. Okay, so then the hundred goes to Apple US. And it is then assessed at the 10.5% rate after the 50% rate? The 100 is guilty mm -hmm. within Apple US, but there is also the Section 78 gross up for the five. Okay. So that the total gotcha. income is 105. Now, the 50% Section 250 deduction is 50% of 105. Okay. Okay. And then the five is able, you take the five as a tax credit, which is reduced to four after the section 960D 20% haircut, subject to the foreign tax credit limitation formula, which is a miserable computation in <laughs> itself. Okay. You know, it's sufficient, Josh, if you just say, yeah, it's a miserable computation. You'll recall maybe that the foreign tax credit limitation formula is the U.S. tax before the credit times foreign source taxable income over worldwide taxable income. Does that sound familiar? You know, after the 32nd time you hear it, I got faith that you'll memorize it. The, the more important thing is not memorizing this nonsense. The more important thing is, gee, does it make sense if it makes sense to you, then in a sense you could derive the formula without even looking at, uh, at uh, 904A of the code. You know, well, why does it make sense? Again, the U.S. does not want to give a credit that would cause the U.S. to collect less than a full 21% on U.S. source income. If there's 100 of foreign source income and 100 of uh, U.S. source income so that there's 21 of U.S. tax before credit on the foreign source income and 21 of U.S. tax before credit on the U.S. source income, the U.S. does not want taxpayer to be able to reduce that 21, that 21 on the 100 of U.S. source income below 21. The formula does that. It protects the U.S. tax base. On U.S. source income, there will always be that 21 payment. The limitation prevents that from being lowered before, below 21. The foreign tax credit can wipe out down to zero, the, uh, the uh, U.S. tax on the foreign source income, but not on the U.S. source income. Again, U.S. tax before foreign tax credit times foreign source income over worldwide income, that is the mechanism for protecting the U.S. tax base. That's why it's there. Okay, the last thing that uh, I'll say before we finish up for the, this evening and, uh, you know, finish up this example of how things are, are meant to work, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the beat for a moment in respect of, of Apple and its planning using its structure that uses AOI. Uh, now, we know that the beat is focusing on outbound expenditures to related parties. Are there any payments by Apple Inc. to the AOI CFC? We mentioned before that there would be a serv some sort of service agreement between disregarded entities in the blob and Apple, where Apple is performing some services, you know, helping with production and things like that, uh, for the AOI uh, blob. But that's inbound payments. The commissions are paid by one of the disregarded entities to Apple Inc. There is no outbound payment in this structure. Because there's 
little or no outbound payment in the structure, the beat really doesn't apply to them. Uh, yes, Logan. Isn't this where you get into like loans from the overseas entities into the United States that you should pay back out? Uh, yes, very, uh, very good point. Now, since the since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the changes have th that have been made, it is possible that yes, AOI might loan money to Apple Inc. You know, they're two different legal entities. They one can loan money to the other. That's an excellent point, Logan. If there is a loan from AOI to Apple, there will be interest payments. Uh, in that case, uh, there would be an outbound payment to a related party. And I would suspect for two reasons that probably Apple will not do very much of this. What are those two reasons? Number one, Apple can control how much loan there is and how much interest cost there is. You may recall you only get hit by the beat if your payments, your outbound payments are more than 3% of your total deductions. So they can control the amount in order to avoid being subject to this. And what's the second reason? Go back to, to T515. Is there a withholding tax in the United States on the payment of interest to a foreign person? Any, uh, anybody have specific memories of this? 30. Uh, you might uh, have recalled that some treaties will have lower withholding rates. AOI up there is not resident in Ireland and as a result cannot claim the benefit of the Irish-US tax treaty. So probably any interest that would be paid would be subject to a 30% withholding tax. Now, maybe there are some ways around that, but at least on the surface, there would be a 30% withholding tax. So for those two reasons, my expectation is that probably they would not cause there to be a large loan with a lot of interest uh, going outbound. Uh, excellent point. Okay, anything else before uh, you escape for the evening? What are we doing Tuesday? What would you like to do? Uh, I don't think that's an option. <laughs> I think, I think I have just been insulted. Oh.